Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. You know, I've had thoughts this week, um, and I'm just trusting the Lord will, will bring them out the way He wants to. And I guess in a way it's connected quite a bit to what we talked about last week. You know, we, we used Paul as an example, and Paul was sharing with the believers to whom he was writing the pattern of his life and what was the principle by which he lived. And, uh, you know, thankfully, it's an awesome thing where he realized that living up to the law as a Jew, as what he had been, a Pharisee, uh, was not going to get it, was not going to win him any kind of acceptance with God. Rather, he needed to throw all his trust in that and in himself, in the trash, and say, Lord, I am yours. I see that Jesus has given me everything that I need, and so my hope and trust is in him. And so I come to a place where I'm forgetting, I'm willing to forget what's behind. I'm willing to die and to join Christ in dying to this old life and, to, and laying hold of the new. But then he, he talked about how he pressed forward and how he reached. But not just reaching in some vague sense. There was something that he actually took a hold of. There was, there was literally something that he was able to take a hold of that made a difference in his day-to-day -day life. And yet, it was a journey. I haven't arrived yet, but this is, how I, this is how I'm moving toward the goal to which God has called me. And, uh, you know, I follow some scriptures, again, very familiar, but I know that the Lord can take something that's familiar and bring out something new and fresh. How many know that? How many of you have had circumstances where you've, there's a scripture you've read all your life, and all of a sudden, one day it jumps off the page, and it means something right where you're at in your journey? And so, uh, I guess... I'm back and forth as to where to start, but I'll go ahead and start in Romans chapter 12. Uh, there's, there's just one thing I want to bring out of this. You know, there's so many different emphases you can make here, but Paul has been laying out the gospel. Here's the foundation, and this is the, the, the foundation we stand upon is, again, is what God has done. He's, done. he's done something about our guilt. He's done something about the fact that, you know, just dealing with our guilt isn't enough. We still live under the power of sin. We have no power in ourselves to rise above it, to do any different than we've ever done, unless he does something, unless he comes in, makes us a new person on the inside, empowers us to live a different life. We're just going to be the same old person. And so, all that he's done, and, and, and Paul, you know, talks about the purpose for which God has called us basically to transform us, to make us into sons and daughters of the living God who are able to live with him forever. It's something I guess we've said many times lately, but somehow the Lord, I believe, is emphasizing this. He certainly is to me because no matter how, how much we affirm these truths, no matter how much we assert them as beliefs that we hold Unless it makes a practical difference in our everyday lives, what good is it? See, that's where God is going with all of this. And I believe with all my heart God wants to help many of us to get off dead center and to begin to grow and to begin to get victory and begin to, get, uh, begin to be changed in real practical ways. God's not satisfied with the people who sit here and practice a religion where they believe all the right stuff. He's after changing us. And the Scripture here, of course, deals with that. Therefore, I urge you. Now, therefore is based on what? Based on what God has done. Based on His mercy. Based on all of this that He's been talking about. Therefore, what's our place in response? What's the proper response to this? You know, a lot of people think the proper response to this is just to accept salvation. Like it's a free gift with no obligation. And it really comes across that way in some places. But I'll tell you, if what kind of salvation is it when we basically are telling God, I want you to take away the guilt of my sins, but it's still my life. I'm going to live it the way I please. See, that's not what we're being saved from, not just the guilt of stuff we've done. It's what we are that needs to be changed. 
And so the only appropriate response for someone who has given their heart and their life to Jesus is what he's talking about here. But it's interesting that he's writing to Christians. So that reminds us that just because we have opened our hearts and invited him in doesn't mean we're, we get it, doesn't mean we have a full-blown understanding. There's still a lot of basic instruction that the Lord has to give us. And the fact of the matter is that we, as even those, those of us who know the Lord, we've actually been born again of his Spirit. Far too much we live in the energy of our old nature. We live in accordance with its ways in accordance with the world. That's what he's dealing with here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, based on what I've been telling you for 11 chapters here, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so there has to come a conscious Lord, I'm not only yours in this vague general sense to go to heaven one day, I am yours to do what, to make the changes that need to be made in my life. I am presenting my life, and I'm presenting it as something where there's a part that has to die. I mean, a sacrifice is something you kill, isn't it? And so what we are recognizing is that this old part of me, the life I have been living, man, there is only one possible solution to that life. And what is that? It's got to die. It's got to die. And, but this, so that this other life can live in its place. So this is not, but this is not just a dead sacrifice where we say, okay, I'm guilty, Lord, kill me. This is Jesus has died in my place, but I am willing to so identify my heart and my life and my spirit with him that I lay down my life so that you can change me. And there is something very definite that God desires for every one of us. Now, there's many aspects of truth here. And you see where, where the, what the end result of this is when you get into this passage. I want to go back to, to verse 2. But basically, where he's going with this is the picture of a people who now, instead of living independent, self-driven, self-seeking lives, now we become a part of a whole. God imparts spiritual abilities to each one, and so we live together in the same sense that my body parts live together and all serve me, presumably. But, but you know, in God's kingdom, there, there's something so much more, so much higher, so much richer that God has planned for us. But so God is taking people who are children of Adam, and transforming them, changing them into a people who can actually live not just for themselves but for one another, can have gifts of God, supernatural gifts that God can operate through them for the benefit of the whole. And we live not, it's not all about me, it's I belong to you. Everything about me belongs to you. I'm not just simply a law unto myself. And so it, it also produces some of these other things he talks about, sincere love, hating what's evil, clinging to what's good, being devoted to one another in brotherly love. This is verse 9 and, and following. Honoring one another above yourselves and having this zeal and spiritual fervor, patient and affliction. I mean, all, all these spiritual qualities, how many of these come from Adam? None. This is entirely the result of, of God's supernatural work in the human heart that is presented to him and say, God, I'm on board with this. This is what I desire for you to do in me. And he goes on, you know, live in harmony. Bless those that persecute you. Live in harmony one with another. Don't be proud. You know, don't repay people with evil. All the things that we observe in the world, God is taking us out of that. Okay. So the question is, how does this happen? Now, last week we talked about Paul reaching for something. I believe there's something in this passage right here that tells us a good deal about the process. How does God actually do what he's doing in me and in you? I mean, how many of you here right now, you're, you know, there's stuff that you're not like this. There's stuff that hangs on and just hangs on and hangs on, and it's what you are. Well, if you're going to be really honest in a practical sense, there's stuff that's there. Well, I'd have to say I'm in the same boat because that's, that's part of being on the journey. There's going to be stuff that God has to deal with. 
But here's the, here's the key right here, I believe. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Now, you know, what's he talking about there? Is he talking about the, the planet we live on? The, the word world refers to the spiritual order of things on this planet. What happened when Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, listen to, to Lucifer, listen to the serpent, and obey him and seek after an independent sort of godhood, what happened? Yeah, sin entered in. There was, a, there was an infection, if you will, of this, of this sin principle in the human family that, we had, that nobody's ever been able to escape. There's no religion that can fix this. There's nothing that can fix it but death. And that's why this is totally beyond us. But, but there is a world out there that has its own way of looking at stuff. And it has its own values. It has all the things that are important to it. You know, the, the, was it John that says, don't be conformed to the world, the, the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. None of this comes from the Father. This is not God's plan, that we should live driven by inner desires in a very selfish way. That's what's made the world like it is. And folks, you and I are far more shaped by the world and the world system in which we live than we care to admit. And is this world system founded on truth? It's founded upon lies. And we see it in operation every single day, and we are living in, I believe, the last period in the world's history. And the picture that is painted for us, for example, in 2 Thessalonians 2, is of a world that reaches a point where they so reject God, so reject truth, so trample on the love of God revealed at the cross that God says, all right, I'm turning you loose. And what God turns them loose to believe is called the lie. It's not even a lie. It's the lie. It's the lie that I can be my own God. My best interest is to seek for my, what I want, to follow my own innate, innate desires. That's what life is about. And we are going to see a world that is increasingly devoted to that, locked into that, where people cannot even be reached that's the world we're seeing evolve, and it's going to come into a society that is a world society that is ruled over by the devil himself. And I'll tell you what's going to end it is the coming of Christ. And one day, there's going, at the time that nobody thinks of such a thing is possible, Jesus is going to come back, and it's going to be curtains for this world. Folks, I don't want to be swallowed up with any of this. I want to have the truth. I want to be entirely exactly what we were just singing. You know, let the worshipers arise. Let us be entirely identified with Jesus Christ without shame, without apology, because this world is demanding that we bow, that we bow down and, and just affirm everybody and everything. But I'll tell you, there is one name above every name in this world, and it's the name of Jesus Christ. He alone is worthy of being worshipped as we worshipped him this morning. Praise God. But, oh, I'll tell you what, we are shaped by the environment in which we live. And how many times have we talked about young people? Because the tendency of every young people is to want to be a young person, is to want to be accepted. So how do you achieve this acceptance? You compromise, you conform, you accept the values of your peers, you try to please them, you try to go along. I'll tell you, if you listen to the wisdom of, that has come to the people of the world, you will be in bondage, you will be in blindness, and you will wonder how you are like you are if you have any, any sense at all. How did I get this way? And I'll tell you, there's a, there's a powerful force that, that would absolutely bind every one of us. How many of you know what a habit is? Yeah. I mean, how many of you, let's use one of our favorite examples, how many of you, when you're going down the road and you get behind a turtle, you stop and think, now, let me think about this situation. 
how should I understand this and how should I react? What would be the logical choice for me? How many of you, you know, do that? No, however you naturally react, it just happens. How did you get that way? Yeah, following your nature and following your nature and following your nature and it happens again and again and you get to the point where you don't think about it anymore. You know, we have, it, our mind is not just the, this conscious thing where we're thinking about something and thoughts are going through our heads. There is a whole buried down deep unconscious mind and I'll tell you, we have spent our lives burying stuff in there. Every one of us is different, but every one of us has taken from our experiences, from our environment, from our parents, from our own, uh, from our peers, from the world around us, the media, the movies, you name it, we are being inundated with the world's wisdom, which of course is wonderful truth, isn't it? No, it isn't. And every one of us has stuff in here. So what, what that does many times is brings us to a place where we can affirm something that the Bible says. But the reality is when we are in the situation that that, that verse or that saying of the Bible, apply, where it applies, we don't do that. Why not? Because we've been conformed to this world. And the thing is, a Christian can just mindlessly go on and imagine that this is how life is. You know, I'm just the way I am, as though God can't even change us. I mean, how many of us from a practical standpoint have gotten to that point in some areas of our lives? I mean, God, God himself doesn't have an answer for this one. I'm just stuck this way. I mean, if you put it into words, that's what we actually believe. That's how we, we live as if that's true. And I'll tell you, there's a God who wants to begin to deal with those deep places of bondage in our lives and remove the chains. But unless he can get down into those deep places, unless he can get down into those areas where Habit has just taken a hold, and this is our mentality. This is the way we look at life. This is how we react to certain situations. And this is how we justify how we act in certain situations. And it goes on and on and on and on, this mentality that just has been built into us in a practical sense. I'm so thankful God is patient. I mean, you know, if it were, if it were you and me looking at, looking at us and looking at the I mean, we just throw, throw up our hands and say it's hopeless. But I'll tell you, we serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. And he has declared his intention to change us into the image of his son. And I believe with all my heart he is doing that. The process is painful at times, but I'll tell you, he doesn't want us simply to be mindless robots. He's not creating artificial intelligence where he just programs us and we we walk and we say hallelujah and all that kind of stuff. God wants people who will take hold of his truth. And it will become so deeply rooted in our hearts and in our spirits that that will become the thing that causes, that governs our actions and our reactions in the world. Do you believe that's possible? Yeah, yeah. and of course we all say yes. And then, and then we say, yes, yeah, some way, somehow. And then in a practical sense, under our breath, no way. I believe God wants to take away that no way. Because I can, I can think of areas of my own heart. You know, the reality is, we, we would look at somebody who lives under the chains of alcohol, something obvious. And many of us would sort of, you know, well, that's a shame. You know, God can deliver them. We have faith for them, of course. And yet every single one of us has areas of our lives that do not conform to what God is, is intending to make out of us. It may not be something obvious like that, but I'll tell you what, there's not one of us who's any different. The issue may be different, but the particular manifestation of this old nature is, is just, I mean, it's the same. It's all, it comes from the same nature. 
So I'll tell you, there's not one of us here who has the right to look down on anyone. We stand on the same ground with the same need. And I'll tell you, if you don't think so, you hang around, God will have a way, his way of showing you what you are. Now, thank God he doesn't do it to destroy our confidence and, you know, just grind us down. He does it so that we'll wake up, humble ourselves, do what he's talking about here, say, God, I can't fix this. God, I present myself to you. I need to be changed. And that's what this is about. So the, the beginning point is we've got to recognize we've got a problem. We are full of the world in one way or another. We're full of it. We listen to its attitudes. We drink them in. We act them out, and they become so ingrained in us, we don't have to think about it anymore. We just act and react. Okay, how in the world is God going to deal with something like that? I mean, you think about it. That's, that's a pretty deep challenge. I can't fix it, that's for sure. But listen to what he says, but be transformed. Be transformed. I'll make the point as I've often made it before. This does not tell us to transform ourselves. God is not in the business of merely giving us information and say, here's how you fix it, go for it. This is a process by which we surrender to him, we trust him, we open up our hearts to his saving process. And we are the recipients of his action. He's the only one who has the power to save me. If, if, if he won't do it, I'm, I'm lost. I have no hope. But thank God for a, for a God who is willing and able to save completely those who come to God by him because he ever lives to make intercession for us. Thank God. Praise God. So this is a passive thing. I occupy the place of someone who is receiving something that God is doing. Okay? Be transformed. But how is this happening? By the renewing of the mind. Now, again, this is not simply teaching us on, on this superficial level the doctrines we're supposed to believe. Now, it involves knowing those things. But this is where God has to get down into that part, that unconscious part that actually controls the way we really are. God has to replace those things that have caused us to act in a certain way, maybe when we're chasing the turtle. You know, it's something we can all identify with. But God has to do something that actually changes this so that it, our natural the, the reaction that we come up with without even thinking about it is the one he wants instead of the one that has been in there because we just are a child of Adam living in the world. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. While it is not required, a donation of $10 for DVDs and $5 for CDs is suggested to help with expenses. Also, for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your requests to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.